introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers, Dr. Bellani and um, uh, Dr. Mobley, there for the kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to come to Bangalore. This is where I grew up and did my medical education, so it's uh, it's an added bonus. Um, so I direct the cardio oncology clinic at the University of Minnesota, which is probably uh, some of you are, are familiar with. Um, so we take care of a lot of cardiac-related issues in um, cancer patients, both during active treatment and um, in uh, cancer survivors. So my talk today is pertaining more towards um, patients who are in the survivorship uh, stage of their lives. So here are the learning objectives of my talk. Um, I hope to spend uh, the next few minutes um, and bring some um, exposure to recognizing that chest radiation can lead to vascular and valvular disease, um, and that it can be a latent phenomenon, and um, hope to um, recommend some appropriate treatment strategies to manage uh, radiation-associated valvular heart disease. So just a few basics. Um, radiation doses above 30 grays are usually associated with uh, cardiac damage. Um, it can affect, as I mentioned, any of the cardiac structures and uh, the thoracic vasculature. Um, it essentially results in intimal injury with proliferation of myofibroblasts um, and lipid-containing macrophages resulting in atherosclerotic plaque, collagen deposition, and um, interstitial fibrosis. So um, there are a few risk factors that are associated with radiation-induced um, uh, cardiovascular injury. Higher dose, as you can imagine, um, can be lethal to the heart as a um, kind of a bystander. Um, if there are other comorbid conditions uh, that an individual has, uh, then the, um, the risk of damage to the cardiac structures is greater. A younger age at the time of irradiation is also a risk. Um, and the injury can involve anywhere from acute injury to late injury to any um, of the other structures that are involved as listed here. Acute injury is typically a thing of the past um, where the pericardium and the myocardium are affected. Usually what we land up dealing with are the latent effects or the late effects um, that result in um, constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, um, and valvular disease, both a stenotic and regurgitant uh, valve disease. Here is a, um, a pictorial depiction of um, the various uh, structures that can be affected anywhere from the lining of the heart to the proximal coronary arteries, the thoracic aorta, uh, which becomes a big problem when the surgeons um, are planning for um, replacing the valves because they need to find a place to cross clamp the aorta which becomes an issue, um, and um, some of the other interstitial fibrosis and the uh, valvular disease um, as depicted in the right panel at the bottom side. As I mentioned, um, it's, it's important to note that most of the, the latent effects that we're seeing now is from radiation therapies that occurred in the past. So previously, obviously, the, the focus was to kill the tumor. So a lot of the high-dose, wide-field um, radiation therapy was a thing of the norm, um, where a lot of the, the cardiac irradiation uh, was, um, and minimizing the effects of it was sort of uh, not the priority back then. Um, and hence, you know, all these delayed effects were, uh, are being more recognized recently. And also, I think I should mention, that the cancer survivors are living longer because of all the advancements that we've had. So we're seeing a lot of the survivors. More of the contemporary radiation uh, treatments um, now minimize the amount of radiation delivery uh, and, and hone in on the tumor, um, thereby reducing the backscatter um, and uh, cardiac irradiation. The future appears to be more promising in that um, with proton therapy and things, um, uh, these are more effective um, and less cardiotoxic. Here are a couple of uh, quick examples. I'm not a radiation oncologist, but uh, since we deal with this, I think it's important to note on the left panel, uh, this is the traditional uh, anterior-posterior approach where the cart was right in the, uh, 
in the field of the radiation therapy. And um, the panel to the right is a more a directed um, a radiation therapy to the tumor. Um, I think it's important also to note um, here's a case of a patient who had uh, breast cancer underwent mastectomy on the left side with uh, deep breath holes, how you could move the heart away from the field of uh, radiation. So these kinds of advancements are kind of the norm these days. So a couple of quick facts about radiation-associated valve disease. Um, this occurs in about 50 per, about, uh, in about 50 percent of the patients who have had previous mediastinal radiation. Aortic valve and mitral valves are the most commonly affected. Um, and as I mentioned, the affected valves can have both stenosis or regurgitation and or both. And I have a, um, a few case here, um, reviews that I'm going to go through to sort of illustrate this. Um, 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 so this point, um, it's not just the valves, but also the structures surrounding the valves. So the valve annulus, the subvalvular apparatus, um, the aortomitral curtain, which is also very important, very pathognomonic of the um, the, the radiation-associated valve disease, is an important um, um, feature uh, that the surgeon needs to pay attention to because that's where they the, the suture the valve. Uh, the aorta, as I mentioned, cross clamp becomes an issue. Uh, lung problems, they can have interstitial fibrosis, so uh, reduced lung uh, function and those kinds of things come in the way of um, uh, doing a surgical repair. Conduction system um, can also get affected, so complete heart block is another problem. So let's uh, sort of delve into some of the case reviews and the essence of time. Um, here I have a 50-year-old woman, uh, previous um, Hodgkin's disease at age 17, no other comorbid conditions. She was actually a farmer out in, uh, so these are actually all the real case, uh, true cases we have actually dealt with in the last couple of years in Minnesota. Um, <clears throat> no other comorbid conditions, so fairly healthy, was very active and um, started to develop some shortness of breath. Uh, initially was treated for pneumonia um, and um, eventually then developed heart failure symptoms and uh, you know, her primary care physician uh, listened to her heart and picked up a murmur which led to an echocardiogram. Typically we start off, as a cardiologist, we look at a lot of transthoracic echoes, uh, a lot of black and white stuff and uh, and hope to make sense of this. So this is an example of a, a very common finding in someone who has had chest radiation where the windows are not the best. Uh, you have to make do with what information you can get. But you can see that there's some calcification in the region. This is an apical three-chamber view. Uh, some calcification in the aortic valve level, which does not appear to be normal. Here is a color Doppler to showing some flow acceleration in the aortic valve area with a little bit of regurgitation. Let's move into some um, diagnostic imaging here. So this is short axis of the aortic valve on a uh, trans um, 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 thoracic um, echo um, showing a pretty stenotic aortic valve there. So, and uh, gradients to support um, aortic valve gradient upwards of four meters on the uh, left lower panel. Uh, so clearly this is a patient who is symptomatic with aortic stenosis. Um, not much in the way of comorbid conditions. Here is, uh, this is a TE conference, so I need to pay attention to the images that I uh, display here. So I, I think you'll all agree that the aortic valve is not looking very happy at all. Um, short axis view of the aortic valve and uh, some long axis views. Um, so essentially, the point here is, and oftentimes these patients, especially women, have a thick heart and a small heart. Um, so you got to pay attention to how you resuscitate them after the cardiopulmonary bypass as well. Um, but the LV function is pretty good. So let's kind of review some of the guidelines, what we would do. I think everybody would agree with me that this is a patient who would benefit from aortic valve replacement, if possible, rather than one of the, uh, the percutaneous options, given that she has minimal uh, comorbid conditions. So. Um, Class one indication for surgical repair. Uh, this is the, the Nishimura guidelines, the valvular heart disease guidelines from 2017, which, um, which I'll allude to a number of times during my talk. So, um, so this patient had a very successful 
aortic valve replacement. Um, in spite of her young age, she chose a bioprosthetic valve because um, of the lifestyle uh, options, and she didn't want to be on, uh, on uh, warfarin for the rest of her life. So a good replacement, good success, but unfortunately in her case, the cancer came back a year after the valve uh, replacement. Um, so what do we know about uh, patients who, under, um, who have previously undergone uh, mediastinal radiation, who have severe aortic stenosis, undergo AVR? I think you all would agree with me that the outcomes of these people who have had radiation therapy to the chest, they don't do just as good as their age ma matched uh, cohorts without radiation. So these are uh, Kaplan-Meier curves, the survival curves, looking at uh, patients who underwent AVR uh, who have had uh, previous uh, radiation therapy versus individuals who had uh, no radiation therapy. So their survival is compromised. Um, and, um, and why is that? I mean, perhaps this study would shed some light uh, about looking at some midterm survival in these patients undergoing SAVR, which is surgical aortic valve replacement. So the more comorbidities uh, these patients have who've had radiation therapy, they fare worse compared to um, um, uh, these individuals who have um, just the AVR. So the reason for why they don't do well, as you can imagine, is because of some of the cardiopulmonary disease, some of which is manifest and some of which is um, not manifest. Um, and uh, the mechanism of death in these individuals are typically adhesions, pulmonary fibrosis, and other cardiac issues. Um, so this kind of brings up a question of, you know, could these patients uh, with severe AS in the setting of prior radiation therapy be served by TAVI? Uh, TAVR used to be a, uh, a prior acronym, but TAVI. Um, and uh, um, there isn't any long-term data in uh, patients who undergo TAVI, uh, in patients who have had radiation therapy. But some of the short-term and um, in intermediate-term survival is looking pretty favorable. So the next uh, few cases that I have, uh, I'll show you what we've, uh, how we have successfully used TAVI to treat some of these aortic and mitral valve disease um, uh, pathology. So here's a seven, case two. This is a 71-year-old woman with, again, prior history of left breast cancer, treated with radiation many years ago, with severe COPD admitted for heart failure after she came back from a cruise. She was doing really well, and a lot of these patients, you know, they, um, after their treatment of cancer, kind of go back to their primary care physicians, and they're not actively being under surveillance and be told that they have a, uh, a heart murmur that needs to be monitored, and I think that's w one important intervention that we could do in patients who have had previous radiation therapy, that they are at risk for coronary disease, and they are at risk for um, significant valve disease. Um, so this lady had a loud ejection murmur in the aortic position. I think you all could guess what this could be. It had a very high frailty score. So it poses a bit of a challenge for surgeons to go and surgically fix this valve. And I think you would agree this is another transthoracic view looking at the aortic valve. It's, it's pretty sclerotic and restricted in its motion. And this is a zoomed word, uh, view of the aortic valve again, um, demonstrating that there is a significant AS. Um, so I don't want to belabor the point, but there are more uh, pictures here uh, kind of, uh, again, r writing home the same point, severe AS. And what do we do in somebody like this who, has, who, who poses to be a high surgical risk uh, are there things that, uh, what does the guidelines, do, do the guidelines provide us any kind of an information or, or uh, of, of what sh we should be able to, to provide them? And I think based on the high surgical risk, uh, the current guidelines say at least you could consider, if you have a bold surgeon, consider doing a uh, surgical aortic valve or you could consider uh, doing a trans, um, 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 uh, cutaneous approach um, uh, or a TAVI. So this patient had a very successful, based on her comorbidities and a, a good interventional cardiology group that we have, underwent a um, 
uh, uh, trans uh, aortic valve replacement with a core valve. A core valve is a metronic valve. This is a self-expanding nitinol framed valve which um, um, where there is a, a pericardial porcine valve, um, uh, a pig valve within. Um, so one of the features of this TAVR valve is that it resides a little bit lower in the LVOT and it self-expands. So uh, this is one of the two valves that is approved in the United States, the core valve and the Edward Sapien valve. So this patient did really well after the aortic valve replacement. So moving on, um, here's a case of a 79-year-old woman, again, with prior history of breast cancer, radiation to the left breast. Um, <clears throat> um, progressive dyspnea, heart failure, so clearly symptomatic, lots of comorbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, reduced lung function, uh, also has a reduced EF, so you ought to think about low gradient, low flow aortic stenosis in these patients. STS score was pretty high. So the surgeons weren't too eager about taking her, but the other issue was she posed a dilemma in that she had not just one valve disease, but a kind of a mixed valve disease with the mitral valve and the aortic valve uh, being affected. So let's see what uh, options we have for her. Um, so as you can see, a lot of calcification in the mitral annulus and the mitral valve area, uh, large atria. So this has been going on for a number of years and uh, um, a little bit of regurgitation, so the stenosis and regurgitation of the mitral valve, and then the aortic valve as well is diseased with the restricted flow. <clears throat> Not a lot of aortic insufficiency, but um, the valve area is quite compromised. But if you look at the Doppler tracing, this patient has a classic case of a uh, low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis based on the valve area, moderate MR, and mild MS. So lots of things here to chew on and um, with very limited options available. Um, so again, let's refer to the guidelines and see what uh, help we can get. So someone who has a lot of comorbidities, I guess there's some data to say you can go after the aortic valve and give them the option of TAVR, but what do you do about the mitral valve is the big issue, and that's a pretty diseased valve. One would argue that um, you can address the, um, the aortic valve now and see how she does, and then when the technology improves, go after the mitral valve. Um, so in her case, TAVR was an option for the aortic. Indications from mitral valve, just a quick recap. Looking at uh, the 2017 guidelines, um, uh, patients who are not undergoing um, bypass surgery who have progressive MR, you could make an argument if the surgery, a surgical risk is fairly high that you could just monitor them. So essentially saying we don't have an option now, we'll, we'll keep you uh, under surveillance. So this patient actually um, had a pretty good outcome, I should say. So we fixed the aortic valve. We put an Edward Sapien valve, um, which is another TAVI. Um, so this is a low-profile valve with an outer skirt. Uh, so this is a it, it, this is a, a, a cow valve, a pericardial valve from a cow, which is uh, within uh, this uh, stainless steel frame. Um, low-profile. It's been approved uh, in the United States for valve and valve uh, TAVI. Um, and um, there are a lot of uh, newer iterations of this uh, valve, so currently Edward Sapien valve uh, 3 um, is, um, is, is used. So it functions really well and uh, is placed uh, fairly well in the, um, the aortic position. So the patient did well. Uh, the mitral valve disease, uh, she's currently uh, under surveillance to see what uh, options would be available. So quickly, let's look at uh, another case here, uh, another case of Hodgkin's uh, with prior radiation, um, several months of uh, dyspnea, multiple thoracentesis, which is an outside of heart failure. Um, patient had uh, both a systolic and a uh, diastolic uh, murmur. Uh, most of the TAVIs when we talk about is in the setting of stenosis. There's not a whole lot that's talked about in the setting of aortic insufficiency but this patient had a fair bit of AI. Um, 
Um, <clears throat> Not only that, this patient also had a fair bit of tricuspid regurgitation and a fair amount of uh, pulmonary hypertension, um, a group two pulmonary hypertension from the valve disease. So um, lots of things going on in this patient. So a TEE, again, demonstrating that the AI is quite significant. Um, and you can kind of see the thickening of the leaflets. So this patient had a, um, <clears throat> a core valve placed for AI um, and uh, did really well without any, as you can see, no residual aortic insufficiency in the bottom panel. Um, so this takes, so this is not FDA approved, so uh, it takes a little bit of uh, getting uh, approval. This is my last case, the, probably the most interesting case. This is actually um, a lawyer um, <laughs> who came to see as a 58-year-old gentleman who um, had sort of exhausted other options uh, from other hospitals and seeing uh, surgeons. Um, kind of a, a prototype of a case, Hodgkin's lymphoma, mantle radiation, symptomatic, had uh, mixed valve disease. Uh, if you can't remember anything from my talk. If you remember this picture, I think this is probably the prototype of a, a radiation-induced um, heart disease with mitral valve, the, the mitral aortic uh, curtain, the aortic uh, valve all being sclerosed, restricted, calcified. So um, let's uh, quickly go through this. MS, AI, MR. This is all in one case. Patient also had uh, severe AMS uh, and uh, a lot of calcification in the uh, thoracic aorta. So he was presented to our surgeons, but the surgeons turned him down because of the degree of calcification in the, uh, in the thoracic aorta. So here were his options. He was listed for heart transplant, young guy, no other comorbidities, medical therapy, which was not acceptable because he was symptomatic. There's not much you can do, uh, hospice uh, with continued medical therapy. Uh, and we considered a TAVR and a TMVR, so a trans, uh, trans uh, mitral valve replacement, transcutaneous mitral valve replacement, uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. So this patient actually did pretty well. Um, so here is the right ventricle, it's a little enlarged. This is the LV small. Um, LV uh, with the mitral, in the mitral position you have an adverse sapien valve uh, in a native annulus and the aortic uh, position too there was a, a, an adverse sapien valve that was deployed and uh, patient's doing pretty well. He has had a bout of endocarditis and uh, needed to have a, a, a pacemaker for complete heart block, uh, but uh, yeah, he's doing pretty well. So in summary, this is my uh, summary points. Uh, they should, you know, these patients should be under periodic surveillance, aortic calcification, valvular disease are commonly seen decades after radiation therapy. TAVR can be safely performed in stenosis and regurgitation and in high-risk patients. So I'll conclude with this. I'm sorry I've gone over the time. and. Uh, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That was really very interesting.